Hi, I'm Dr. Jason J. Campbell, and I want to thank you for taking the time to watch my videos. I'm, com I'm continuing my lecture series into introduction to methods of qualitative research. Introduction to methods, yeah. I can never remember the title. Um, and we're on section 1.7 of my notes. This is page 20 of the notes. As you know, you can click the link in the description field. It'll take you to the PDF. Download the PDF, use it to supplement your readings. Um, we're continuing with Michel Foucault's discussion into power knowledge, and what I've been doing for the last two sections is giving an account of power knowledge, very, very sort of <coughs> condensed account, but not just the account of Michel Foucault, because this is not about um, Foucault's concept per se, or his articulation of power, but the way in which that, the way in which his discourse applies to qualitative methodologies. So in terms of qualitative methods, our approach, our goal in this lecture series is to, one, have an understanding of what the theorist is doing in terms of their theoretical um, approach and how their theoretical approach can apply to qualitative methodologies, how we can use their theory uh, and the understanding, the understanding that we gain of their theory in an application of qualitative methods. One thing that we recognize with uh, Foucault's discussion of power, I think one of the most important things is the relational aspect of power, right? Um, power is inherently dialectical, right? It manifests itself within a nexus of relationships. And resistance to power and power, the preservation of itself, is such that we shouldn't always sort of de facto think of this in terms of a very negative or pejorative sense, right? We shouldn't think of power as being a, a bad thing. It is, right? It is the condition for which all of this exists. The idea is, in terms of our qualitative methods, to recognize that in interviewing our participants, there's many different things that discuss this sort of quick recap, but in interviewing our participants, it's important to understand not just the relationships of power, if we're talking about power and the dynamics of power um, for our participants, not just the immediate reference to power. So organizational power, I was having this dispute with my boss, my boss said this, or the people in my community and I are having conflict with respect to these concepts and this is how we mobilized. But a recognition that insofar as, and this is the, I think this is the brilliant aspect of um, Foucault's analysis, insofar as we seek to transform our power relations, to arrive at a more sort of equity-based or uh, equality in, in power, insofar as we do that, we recognize that we offset, There's a, it's a perpetual um, it's a perpetual fight for equilibrium. It's perpetually the case. It, you know, according to the analysis, it will never be the case that we arrive at a truly egalitarian state, right? It, it, it won't be the case that power is um, shared and shared equally. It's not to say that we shouldn't posit that as a goal. Of course, that's the goal. But the truth of the matter is it's about how we negotiate and how we deal with um, the power that we want other power that we don't want to lose, right? And and that's and that's sort of the crux. What I'm going to do, I think this is the last. I think this is the last section for uh, Foucault. Let me just check. Uh, no, we have another section. Um, so Foucault, quite a bit, quite a quite a bit of analysis into Foucault. What I want to do in this section is apply more rigorously. I gave you some of the theory with respect to Michel Foucault's application um, in terms of power. And um, I applied it also with Spivak's previous account. What I'm going to do is look at data interpretation, how we can use Foucault's discourse on uh, this approach to power, this understanding of power knowledge, um, how we can apply this to the interpretation of our qualitative findings. Obviously, by data, I'm talking about the transcription from your interviews, right? Our data in qualitative methods is a transcription of what was said, and how can we use Michel Foucault and his approach to interpreting data? So of all the sections that I've done before, though the other sections were very important, this section, 1.7, with respect to Michel Foucault, is directly going to apply um, to your qualitative methodologies. So with that, let's begin. This is uh, intro... And it's section 1.7. Okay, so um, five functions of thought. 
This is a very, very important sort of section, so the five functions of thought. Of thought. The first is the expansion and modification of knowledge. The expansion, transformation, transference, modification of knowledge. And 1A says, here's a direct quote, quote, and this comes from uh, Foucault's The Order of Things, uh, genius book. I'm actually going to do, uh, uh, this is one of my goals for next year, is to do a really, really thorough, detailed, meticulous reading of Foucault for my own independent research and my writings. Um, and after I send it off to the press, I, I intend on writing another book next year. After I send it off to the press, I'm going to take all the notes that I compiled from various Foucault texts, because next year is like my Foucault year. I'm moving away from German philosophy, much to my dismay because I absolutely adore the Germans and their thinking. I need a new, ch I need a change, I need a different perspective. Um, so next year is going to begin my sort of French existentialist mode, and I might be in this mode for a decade. <laughs> but I'm going to be, I'm going to begin with um, Foucault, and after I finish the publication, send it off to the press, I'll more than likely do a really sort of dense, strictly Foucauldian analysis um, of many of his texts, but the order of things being one of them. So, that's a little bit of a side note. So let's read this quote from The Order of Things. This is 1A on top of page 20. What is essential is that thought, both for itself and in its workings, right, for itself, sort of knowledge for the sake of knowledge, and the function with which it is used, should be both the expansion of knowledge and the modification of what is known. The expansion of knowledge and the modification of what is known. So anybody who, who has taken an intro to philosophy, sort of philosophy 101 course, you always begin with sort of the um, etymological deconstruction of the word philosophy, right? So philosophy, um, the love of the love of knowledge, the love of wisdom, right? Each parts Sophia, the love of just like Philadelphia's brotherly love, philosophy is the love of wisdom, the love of knowledge. I'm here to tell you, as a fervent <laughs> lover of knowledge, there are, good and, there are good and sort of less good aspects to the love of knowledge, but one aspect of this pursuit, this a truly philosophical life, is a recognition that this pursuit, the love of knowledge, is never-ending, right? The first bit that we that was said in the quote, for itself, right? The love of knowledge for the sake of just the pursuit of more knowledge, the pursuit of more understanding, the discovery, perpetually, and uncovery, this is important, right? This, the discovery and uncovery of things not known, right? What knowledge does is knowledge, one aspect of knowledge, one aspect of knowledge is the perpetual pursuit of more information, more knowledge, uh, greater insight, broader nexus, and for some, the true philosopher, as an end in itself, knowing that you will never facilitate that end, that end will never reach its climax. So, in terms of this love of wisdom or knowledge, in terms of this love of wisdom or knowledge, one aspect of philosophy, one aspect of, of this pursuit of thought, this pursuit of knowledge, is the fact that it is expansive. It's a perpetual um, pursuit. Um, this expansiveness of knowledge this pursuit of knowledge for its own end um, would make really, really good grounding in uh, qualitative methodology, the attempt to try and find this in the discourse. And this is not to say that you'd have to interview a professor or a researcher in any regard, though that would help as well. And it asks, the question that, that might arise is to ask the individual, you know, why is it that you continue to do X? You can imagine that an individual has attained a certain amount of wealth, or status, or privilege, or position in life. Um, a certain amount of, you know, a certain amount of comfort might have been attained. A certain amount of intellect might have been attained. You have your PhD now, you have your job. Why continue? Um, there's really nothing, no need, per se, to continue, but why continue? The attempt to ask, this, these are the type of why questions that I love, the, the attempt to try and answer why the individual persists, independent to any external need to persist, independent to any external motivations like economic or, you know, reputational or what have you, prestige and status, might be 
the perpetual satisfaction in uncovering more, right? There's a certain newness, right? And it's hard to explain for, I mean, many of us feel this, but as a professional academic, it's hard to describe the feeling of finding this new thing. I never thought of that. I didn't think I can compare Joseph Campbell with, uh, um, with um, Dietrich Spivak's account in terms of a call. And I didn't think I could take that call and make it to connect to maybe, you know, um, drives in society, motivation factors for social good. And, oh, wow, that's a good, you know, I have to reach. This is my own lecture. I did this before. It's part of, part of, part of the, the satisfaction, waning as it is, but uh, part of everything is in an end. But the part of the satisfaction is that discovery, that perpetual discovery. And in terms of thought, in terms of knowledge, it is the pursuit of knowledge for the pursuit of knowledge. The pursuit of knowledge as an end in itself. And I don't want to, I don't want to make moral implications and good, bad implications if this is something you ought to do or ought not to do. Any diversity of people watch my videos and, and the idea is I'm, I want to let you know that if you are motivated to pursue knowledge and your intent is good and just, go for it, right? Go for it. Try to uncover more. Try to understand more. Try to make better connections of the world so that you can make sense of, you can make sense of our human interaction. And with your participants, you want to create that atmosphere, right? You want to create that atmosphere. And in terms of the type, and you will determine who you um, invariably decide on interviewing, the type of person you interview, for your qualitative methodologies, figuring out why they persist. Why are you persisting? Why are you still in this line of work? Why, why haven't you changed fields or quit or done some other thing? Why... After all this time, after all these, you know, after all these accomplishments, after all of this, are you still in it? There is a resilience that's afforded the individual by the satisfaction of contributing, by the satisfaction of identifying things that hadn't been connected before, by giving others an opportunity to make insight that they otherwise might not be able to make without this co-creative process. That's important, right? So in terms of your qualitative um, methodology, uh, anyone in your, anyone of your participants in any field that you might choose, if they are in a line of work, it doesn't have to be academia, where they persist, irrespective to any external needs to persist, they continue to do this year after year after year, decade after decade after decade, and they're making gains and they're making contributions and they see themselves as successful, as broadly defined as that is, asking them why. The motivation, they persist, is a genius, it's, a ge it's just a genius qualitative, um, it's a just, a, and I'll give you more later, I'm starting to sort of get a level. It's a genius mode of understanding those motivating factors, um, and also those conditions of knowledge itself that keep them interested in their field. Um, any academic professional who does this enough, it's, it's the new discoveries, it's the new graduate student, it's the new research topics, it's the new insight that keeps us going um, for, for some of us, for no other end than discovering more and finding out more. So um, that love of wisdom could and probably does serve as a motivating force, right? The motivating force, right? That, that love of wisdom as a motivating force in the individual researcher's life, in the participant's life, as a means of uncovering more, as a means of understanding more, as a means of contributing socially more, um, it's 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 just filled with uh, with good with good possibilities, right? For for, for the research. So the first bit, um, what is essential is that thought, both for itself and in its workings, which I need to describe the second part. In its workings, should we recognize should is an ethical claim, should be both the expansion of knowledge and a modification of what it's known. The idea is knowledge exists and the realm, the scope of human knowledge has definitive limits. It's not something arbitrary or abstract in any regard. We know we have yet to solve this problem, if it's a mathematical formula. We know we have yet to discover um, all the species that exist on the planet, despite the fact that we've been, and our biologists have been exploring for, you know, for centuries. We know that we have yet to think of all the ethical implications of our social interactions. There's still so much we have not done. So the idea is in terms of motivation, that motivating force has to take account of the scope of our knowledge, right? It would be, it would be completely um, a waste of time 
to be motivated to continue in the expansion of knowledge where discoveries and understanding have already been attained. Right? You don't want to try and uh, you know, discover the gravitational constant if it's already been discovered. You don't want to try and write about the sort of American pragmatism as per purse um, because it's already been done, or, or, or in terms of um, Williams and such, because it's already been done. You, you need to understand your motivation has to be incorporated within an understanding of what already exists. You need to know. Um, the, genius of, the genius aspects of knowledge is that motivation has to always already, this is important, right? Motivation has to always already be informed by the scope, right? So this motivating force must be informed by the, by the scope. Um, graduate students who are writing their PhDs, it's important to recognize that you feel comfortable, and if you have a good committee, and most of you, I mean, all of you will, I'm sure, uh, a good committee is a committee that will tell you to be very clear in delimiting your scope, right? Your scope's too broad. Your scope's too specific. Okay, why is that important? It's important because insofar as you delimit your scope, your motivation to uncover more, your motivation to make contributions to the existing literature, and uh, the justifications that you're going to build based on your literature review itself, literature review justifying the points that you're making in your analysis, it's important to recognize that in terms of that motivation, your motivation becomes um, precise. It becomes, uh, it becomes a tool of precision if you're motivated to make contributions that you know don't exist. So, for example, with me and genocidal intent, you know, I've been doing all this research, I did all my critical lit review, um, and there's a huge gap, there's a huge lacuna, and it's not just me, I, I don't see this work. I spent six months, eight months trying to find substantial writings on genocidal intent, I found a handful of articles, I found no books, it doesn't really totalize, um, it doesn't totalize, it doesn't even approximate the amount of knowledge that should be there with respect to this topic, since... The definition of genocide includes so much um, about intent. So little is written. That's what I want to do. I'm motivated now. My motivation has um, my motivation is directed. It's not just this sort of, and this is the, the the difficult part for graduate matriculation, is the recognition that the idea. It's not to say that you should give up on your dreams. You should give up on the ideals, but you have a more practical, realistic um, aim in your research. Yeah, I wanted to do all this stuff about genocidal intent, uh, not genocidal intent, but genocidal studies and, you know, change the world and da 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 and, you know, make all these big changes. Okay, great, that's all well and good. But now I recognize there's something that's missing. And before I can get to that end state, I have to make this contribution here. So that this applies not just to your participant, it applies to you as a researcher. The first bit in, in Foucault's um, discourse of the functions of thought is a recognition and an acknowledgement of those things you do not know, and the willingness to contribute, to discover more, to understand more. The, the ability to sit down, spend the time, read, so that you have an understanding, and you can fill that void with your own sort of conceptualization, articulation. This is, this is what education's about. This is what it's about. Number two, I'm going to throw this away because this is out of ink. Number two, the contribution to ethical and political discourses, right? So, political and ethical discourses. <clears throat> Contribution to political and ethical discourses. So this is 2A. Modern thought has never been able to propose a morality because it is a mode of action. Knowledge of man is always linked to ethics or politics. And this is very important, right? So I'll read that again. Modern thought has never been able to propose a morality. To propose a morality. It is a mode of action. Knowledge of man is always linked to ethics or politics. So, qualitative application. A great content analysis, qualitative study, might try to identify the historical condition for the disequilibrium between ethical and political social science research. And I'll explain that in a second, right? The, the disequilibrium between political theory and ethics. Philosophers do ethics. Poli sci folks do politics. It's very rare that we have a political discourse that's 
inherently ethical or an ethical discourse that's inherently political. And the question is why? There really is very, very little that has been done um, on this topic, and I'll explain that in a second. Between ethical and political uh, social science research, where considerably more emphasis is placed on the latter rather than the former. That is, on political research rather than ethical research. What is the condition for this social construction? Okay, so you can imagine that when we talk about ethics on the one hand, and we talk about politics on the other, um, there are overwhelmingly, undeniably, similarities between the two, right? So some of the similarities between ethics and politics, the first is that both ethics and politics seek to inform human behavior. They seek to inform collective, not just individualistic, but collective human behavior. And I talked about this, I think, in the last section of the section before that, right? So, informs collective human, right? Both ethics and politics have that same end at mind, right? right? We, as citizens, should act in this way. That should is informed by legal precedence and law. In terms of ethics, we as subjects, rather than citizens, um, should act in this way, and the appeal is to social norms, or it's to God, or it's to some religious community, what have you. But you can see that both ethics and politics are informed, or not informed, both ethics and politics inform collective human action, right? So that's a similarity, obviously, that they share. Another similar, and I'm not going to do all of them, Another similarity that ethics and politics inform is that both ethics and politics, this information, this the manner in which the population is informed, so just to be clear, the manner in which the population is informed is prescriptively, not descriptively. Right? To describe a state of affairs is to say, most famously, the cat is on the mat, when in fact the cat is on the mat. So it's, I see a cat laying on a mat, I say the cat is on the mat. It's descriptively. I'm explaining what I see. Social science research, hard science research, we both do that. We both describe phenomena. Ethics and politics prescribe. They make prescriptions. And these prescriptions come in the form of ought, should, must. Right? You ought to do X, you should do X, you must do X. Right? So both ethics and politics, the way in which we talk about informing collective human behavior, that the means of informing, the, the way in which the population is told indirectly, albeit, um, albeit indirectly, told how to govern themselves is through prescription, right? This prescriptive mode. And I'm not going to deconstruct the prescriptive mode, but there are any number of ways we learn by mimicking others. So you will see the president and the first lady and the kids, and they will, they will, um, you know, in in an inauguration, they will pray. So it's, it's telling you that you know you don't have to pray to the same God, but you should be doing the same. This is a good, this is a good way to model yourself. You will see that people. What I need to recognize <laughs> that I keep missing. You will see, and I'm just using political here because it's about politics, right? So I'm talking about politics because I have to. Um, this is the section. You will see um, the president, he'll take a vacation, right? He'll go golfing. And any president, not just the current president, but he'll, he'll go golfing, he'll go to the beach with the family, they'll go to Camp David and do X, Y, Z. And that's me, Jason. Hey, don't you see what we're doing? You should take a break and not be in the office doing these lectures. <laughs> but, you know, anyway, here I am um, making my contribution. But you get the idea, right? So there's we can you can prescribe behavior by emulating, by seeking to emulate. I'm not going to do a full deconstruction of this because it would take forever. You can prescribe behavior by telling. You can codify it in law, or you can um, describe it, not describe it, but prescribe it within doctrine, liturgy, right? So if it's ethics, it would be more doctrinal. If it's religious, it would be liturgical. If it's political, it would be legal, codified legal code, all of which have exactly the same function. I don't want to spend too much more time on that. And another aspect of ethics and politics is that both ethics and politics, insofar as it informs collective human behavior, and insofar as we talk about the mode in which that behavior is informed, that being prescriptively, 
there obviously has to be both share ethics and politics. There obviously has to be a way to ensure the the um, justification of holding those accountable who do not conform. So there's a justification for for punishment, which sounds harsh, but it's a fact of our existence, right? It's you know I, again, this is not an idealistic lecture. This is a lecture realistically, and realistically, there will be those who refuse to conform to political legal code, there will be those who refuse to conform to moral code, which I, which is a lot harder for me to process. It, 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 you know, life is a long journey, and understanding what that means will require a lot of me, so I can't really speak too much on um, the former. Sort of the refusal to conform to ethic, ethical code, and we're not talking about just being a good um, subject and being nice to your neighbors and such. But the justification for holding one accountable for not conforming is difficult. It really is difficult to understand, irrespective of whether you're a theist or not. It's difficult. I can understand um, being held accountable for breaking the law. Being held accountable for not following ethical moral code is something that's very, very difficult to understand. And if you are a member of a, a you know a religious community, whatever the religious community is, good qualitative methodology might be the explanation of how the church justifies this. How does the church justify holding individuals accountable for not conforming? Um, it's something that is tremendously difficult for me to understand. I, I'm trying to understand it. I just don't understand it. Um, and I'm telling you right now, as uh, there has to be a thousands of me, or maybe 10,000 of me, that want to have an understanding of, okay, I get how the law, you know, the, the law says don't drive over 75 miles an hour, you're doing 95. Okay, I get that. You know, I don't understand how um, an ethical, an ethical infraction justifies punishment or accountability. That's that's a difficult thing to conceptualize. And, and a comparative and contrasting analysis in terms of the similarities and the distinctions between political prescription and ethical prescription would be a phenomenal would be a phenomenal um, poli sci sort of uh, poli sci dissertation, right? So that the idea is a justification. Justification for um, punishment or judgment. I'll say judgment. It doesn't sound so harsh. Um, I think it, number uh, the third bullet point. I think in terms of political infractions, I can understand that well. It's sort of easy to understand, and there are some ambiguities there. The crack laws and the disparity between crack and cocaine. You recognize that there's there's inherent unfairness. You can transform the legal code in order to. Um, to reconcile that disequilibrium, and it's easy to do violence, we can reconcile the legal code so that we can have higher punishment for people who use violent crimes against spouses or, or what have you. Um, but with respect to ethics, it's very difficult to understand how you, you even identify the disequilibrium because there's so many different ethical paradigms that people ascribe to. It's not like one legal code. The ethical code is multifaceted, and thus people are going to be making multifaceted appeals, whereas the legal code is uniform, singular, um, and and there isn't any there's there isn't any ambiguity, and it would help people in their daily lives to try and make sense of it because ethics is so important in our lives, not just for theists, right? Not just for theists, for secularists, for human secularists and such, for atheists, for agnostics, uh, people. Despite believing in God or not, I believe can still act ethically, but the prescriptions and the appeals are going to be different, right? So um, there's tons of research that could be done uh, in that regard. So here's the question: Would the disassociation of ethics from its theological underpinning invite more critical empirical research? Is it a good thing to try and speak of? And I'm not here to say yes or no, right? That's not the. the I'm not here, and I'm really not here defending a position at all. Um, is it a good thing to conceptualize ethics independent to transcendental discourse? I mean, whether it's said to be good or not, there's a ton of um, evolutionary um, ethics. Uh, Philippa Foote's sort of biological ethics is important. Um, uh, Sam Harris's discourse on um, ethics rooted in our biology, evolutionary biology, is important. So yes, there are definitely, and I think there need to be more, accounts that we can live ethically independent to transcendental appeal, 
not because it's to negate transcendental appeal, you know, there's nothing wrong, I don't believe there's anything wrong with individuals making transcendental appeals, provided those appeals result in something that benefits society. If you're making transcendental appeals and you're doing malicious work, well, you're breaking political code and we know what's going to happen. You know, the good guys are going to come and get the bad guys. That's basically how that works. But the idea is, so irrespective of you making transcendental appeals, you make a transcendental appeal and it helps you do good in the world, more power to you. But it shouldn't be the case that if you don't have religious belief, you, you're inherently doomed to act, act immorally. Um, you're inherently doomed to embrace sort of a radical immoralism. I, I do love Nietzsche. Uh, I've, I've studied him forever. But I am straying away from that sort of immoralist camp because, I mean, much to Nietzsche's credit and his absolute genius, he didn't have contemporary discourses on evolutionary ethics and biological ethics and such. Uh, and the idea of sort of, I'm going to act legally, but morality is shenanigans, I think is, is too radical, right? There needs to be some ethics incorporated within our, and informing our political, but it's way easier said than done. It's almost impossible to do, because once the political starts espousing an ethic, then, you know, we have problems. We have problems. We in the states have a very clear separation of church and state. Um, and I'm just telling you as a part, I don't want to share too much of my private life, but if you just live legally and you do everything to make sure that you follow legal code as much as possible, the truth of the matter is you still feel a, a huge guilt and a huge sense of, of judgment and shame for, for things that others might not view as to be moral. Right? So the, you, nobody wants to feel that. Nobody wants to feel shamed. Nobody wants to feel like the bad guy. And if your response is, hey, it's all that I do is legal, but it's the stuff that I'm doing here is immoral is just, that's, it's, I'm telling you, it doesn't work. <laughs> it doesn't work. They're, they're, and I'll stop there. I'll stop there. But living legally is huge. It's very important. But there's something to this morality that I just don't understand at all. I really don't. Um, and if you have an understanding and you can write the next book informing that relationship, you could help me and so many of me out because I don't feel that sense of personal satisfaction just living legally, right? I still, yeah, and it's in my head. I'm not stupid. It's in my head, and I'm sure it's in many other people's head. You still feel sort of shamed if you do things or you're interested in things that are immoral but not illegal, right? So... And hopefully, you know, if it's just a phase that I'm going through and I get back reboot, then that would be great. Um, but it's, it's very interesting in terms of qualitative research, you know, why people make these, these appeals. Why do people make ethical appeals and not just legal appeals? Why do people put such emphasis on um, living ethically um, where there's inherently going to be discrepancies in ethical appeals? Why even put emphasis in it? Part of the reason, and I can tell you this from personal experience, is that sense of shame. It's a very, very powerful tool. And I, do, I definitely, usually, maybe two years ago, I might have felt uncomfortable talking about that publicly, but I really don't now. That sense of shame is heavy because you feel those who live legally and pride themselves in being upstanding citizens, sometimes that's not enough. Because you feel, man, I feel really bad because I do this thing or I like this thing. And it's not illegal, but, you know, I just feel shame from it. Um... And it just, it's in, it might be a, a social, socio-psychological thing, but, you know, that's the end of that. Trust me, there's a ton <laughs> that you can mine from this. And I, I, again, I apologize if it seems too personal. It's always abstract when I say it, but, I, you know, I want to take the things that I experience and the things that I deal with in my personal life and my experience and as a researcher and as just a human being to give a narrative, right? To give a narrative of my life, of the way I see things as informed by the text. And if anything that I say can help you along your research, then all has been, this has been a, a huge, this has been, for me, a huge use of my time productively. Because then, oh, you know, Dr. Campbell said that, I never thought of that before. Maybe I can do this in your research topic. And this sparks my interest here. Let me see if I can um, reconcile this or, or argue for its distinctiveness, which I inherently I feel that the, the two should be, and I, I shouldn't bias it, but it, it, my core tells me the two should absolutely be separate. Um, but I could be wrong, you know, I could be wrong. Alright, so number three. I 
could be wrong. Number three, the establishment and reconstruction of identity, identity relationships. Remember, as we said from, I mean, way back hours ago when we were even talking about Derrida and the critique of Cartesian um, methodological skepticism, the I is always already informed by we. Sort of linguistically, we can talk about the first person singular, sure, but um, ontologically, epistemologically, it is impossible to talk about I independent to others. Because to even evoke the word I in whatever language you speak situates the I within a linguistic community. It necessitates others. We, and this is a fact, we cannot, do not exist without a community of others. We exist with others. Now some of us, like me, I'm extremely introverted as a person. You might not know this from the videos. My students might not feel this or recognize this when I'm in lecture and I'm smiling and I'm talking and blah, blah, blah. But I, as an individual, I like seclusion. I like sort of the comfort of just me being by myself. I, I, I take great comfort in sort of solitude, if you will. And it, it, it helps me do all of this. I need solitude in order to do all of this. So I don't mean in terms of identity relationships, the necessity to be with other people. I don't mean that. Right? And I'll explain this more in a second, I just want to give that little caveat. I don't mean sort of being with others physically in proximity and exchanging stories and such, or being with a community of others. Um, so how do, we, how do we integrate this malleability, this flexibility of identity relationships with um, the expansion of knowledge, with the, the um, um, uh, what's the word, not perpetuation, the pervasive Ness, right? with the pervasiveness of knowledge, with a continual um, mode of wanting to know more. You're a qualitative researcher, aspiring or, or formalized because you're the type of person who wants to know more. You're not going to be content with having questions unanswered. You want to try and use what, the talents that you've cultivated, that you've been given, and you want to use those talents to make sense of your world. And that's a good thing. I don't think that that's, it's clearly not a bad thing, right? The question is, we need to understand that mode of being, that quest for knowledge, that quest for understanding, in terms of its um, contextualization within interpersonal relationships. So let's, let's talk about that. The first point, so this is number three, so we'll talk about identity relationships. Number three, uh, A, this is important, it is through thought that we establish identity and likeness. This might seem really simple, but it's through thought that we establish identity and likeness. There is a sense in which, and this is, this is undeniably true, the individual is likely gravitated towards a collective group. Right? The individual likely gravitates towards a collective group in whatever way you can conceptualize it. It could be, it could be a church community. It could be a biker community, it could be a fraternity, it could be a lodge, it could be um, a book club, it could be, you know, any type of social activity or social, it can be anything. The individual is gravitated towards, is attracted to, uh, is compelled to collective identification because it's through that identification that we reaffirm our identity. Despite the fact that the university you know, we're not holding potlucks together and we're not going out bowling together and my colleagues and I don't necessarily interact and our families don't interact together. I can't tell you how many video lectures I've said I'm part of the ivory tower. I'm part of this community. Um, I'm part of the educational paradigm. It's something I've always wanted to do with my life and I am part of that. I feel allegiance to this community. Um, obviously, <laughs> the amount of work that I'm putting, I feel, I feel serious allegiance to this community. I'm always trying to make it better. And hopefully, insofar as I can make contributions to this community, which reaffirms my identity, I can make a contribution to myself. I can transform myself for the better. I can, I can reassert my allegiance to a community and thus reinterpret the way that I am in the world. And for your participants, you'll see this all the time. Anyone who is interested in sort of personal transformation, this is like motivational speaking 101. I mean, empires of motivational speaking 
and self-help and positive, all that stuff, is built on the foundation of the ability for an individual to transform who he or she is by transforming his or her relationships. I used to hang out with the drinkers and the drug users. I used to hang out with the gangbangers and the killers and the, and the prostitutes and the, you know, I used to hang out with the, you know, the, you know, the frat boys or the, you know, the socialites. And I didn't, you know, I was a bad person then. I felt bad. You know, there was something empty inside because while I gravitated towards this group, the identity that I got in, in response to my allegiance to my association wasn't something I wanted to be. I don't want to be that person. And what does any self-help book say? What does any 12-step program say? What do they change the people that you chill with? If you're not happy, change the people that you're with. You, you don't have to be... I mean, it's important to recognize that theological communities, this is important, right? So if you get that sense of personal identity... Um, and you get it from being affiliated with a church community of any type, hey, knock yourself out. That's, that's good because you know how you feel. I feel better when I'm with these people. If it's not church because you don't believe in church, for me, I'm not here to judge. I'm not here to condemn. No problem. It's not church. Find a community of people that you get that well-being, that sense of fulfillment from. Right? It's, you know, I, a quick side note, but this applies as well. And also to qualitative methodology. This is a great qualitative methodology. And I'm being honest to, I have to be honest to my position as a professor. I have to be honest to my position as a professor. If you're not a believer, it's okay. You know, that's fine. But I'm telling you, it is important to make sure that you still have a community of people that you can re, that you can inform your identity of self. So I heard on NPR, they said, you know, atheists might want to, have like a day that they meet. It doesn't necessarily have to be a Sunday. And you have, you know, a potluck, you have a cookout, you just interact with other non-believers so that you're not there in the middle of nowhere by yourself feeling like it's just me. I don't have a community of people that reaffirm that, no, you're a good person. You might not believe in this deity or this deity, but look what you've done, at, you know, at your job and look how you're making contributions to society. That's good. You're a good person, right? I think one of the, one of the huge problems is again that sense of shaming, right? And again, I know, you know, I'm always in my personal life battling any number of things, but at the end of the day, I'm a, I'm a professor. At the end of the day, I'm wedded to logic, I'm wedded to reason, and I don't want, I hate the idea of using this platform to demonize and to shame other people. Collective identification informs who we are tremendously, tremendously. And if you can't, if you feel discomforted, if your participant feels discomforted, but the, the, the participant found a community that helped him or her reaffirm his or her identity of self, and that reaffirmation made some social contribution, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. And collecting diverse narratives f of, of theists and atheists, of believers and non-believers, of, of all types of community, of Christians and Muslims and Jews, who sat down and recognized that we can make social contributions, I mean, the truth of the matter is, you know, <laughs> we're not all going to be roasting marshmallows. War is never going to come to an end. It's never going to be, you know, kumbaya. It, I just don't, no matter how much I, I, I will never believe that. I will never believe that. But at least you're making your little contribution. And that's the best you can do. For me, this little bit of contribution is not going to make the world a better place. But I'm doing my part, right? I'm doing my part. I'm using the skills and the talents that I have in order to make a contribution, and that's all I can do. If everybody did that, that would be great. And that's sort of the idea, right? Create a community. Right? Create, a, create a community, join a community, so that you can use that to identify um, self. And obviously you'll have a better understanding, not just of the community, you'll have a better understanding of self. And a lot of knowledge, what people don't recognize, is it's self-knowledge. It's an understanding of, I mean, now I'm, I'm sort of speaking on something I need to be practicing, but a lot of knowledge is is you coming to understand who you really are. And it's a lot easier to say it than to do it. I'm here to tell you. Um, so 3B, bottom of page 20. In terms of value, we identify sameness, identity in possession, labor. This is weakening. And I want to read this quote. Economics was, con um, economics was conceived on the basis of barter because in barter, the two representations of property, and this is important, representations, in terms of barter, so you have... Uh, I can't really draw. Imagine you have a, like a chicken leg, and you have uh, you have um, uh, I have no idea. You have a, a um, let's say like a 
a plastic house, like a, a little toy house, right? So you have a chicken leg, <laughs> this is my horrible drawing skills, but you have a chicken leg and you have a little toy, toy house. So economics was conceived on the basis of barter because in barter, the two representations of property, two representations of property, ownership, I, this is my chicken leg, this is, my, this is your plastic house, were equivalent since they were offering satisfaction for almost identical desires. They were in some alike. The idea is in sort of a barter economic, we could trade. You could exchange one thing for the other and what we were exchanging is a sense of, what does he say? Dissatisfaction, right? Were equivalent since they were offering satisfaction for almost identical desires. Now obviously we transform this in terms of money, but that's the whole idea of money is that you use money now instead of trading things. We'd be forever, our houses would be completely in perpetual flux if we lived in a functional barter economy. It, would, it wouldn't be practical to do it, so we use money. Money it might not even be practical when you start to talk about vast sums, so we use sort of debit cards and put our money online. But the, the basic concept is the same. The question is, how in the world does a butter economic apply to this relationship between myself and a collective community? It's exactly the same concept. I gain a sense, what does he say? What is the direct quote? Um, um, where equivalent, were equivalent since they were offering satisfaction for almost identical desires. If a group wants you, right, whatever the group might be, if a group appeals to you, for whatever reason, reason it might appeal, you can recognize that you, insofar as you join the group, are satisfying some desires that the group has, right? This person can help us do X. This person is good at Y. And we want to invite this person to be part of the group. Your contributions to the group satisfies some need that the collective grouping has. The idea that satisfaction and needs and desires are um, unique and exclusive to individual persons is completely wrong. So that the group can have its needs, its desires, its goals satisfied by your participation. Similarly, you can have your own needs and desires satisfied by affiliation with the group. And that the idea is anytime I am in this relationship, that is my individual contribution and relationship with some external group, both of us both the group and myself can have our needs satisfied. We are making an exchange. Now, what's important to recognize, especially in 21st century uh, qualitative analysis, and I think this is absolutely critical. I might not have uh, put this down. Uh, I haven't read the, the next point. Is the realization that we have an opportunity in this era more than any other time in human civilization to have enormous groupings. You can go on Twitter and get 250,000 followers. You can go on Facebook and have a million people, two million, three million people sort of following your feeds. You can go on YouTube and have hundreds of millions of views on a video. And the idea is, in terms, in terms of that grouping, you are in a position to create community. You are in a, Now, I don't look at myself like this in terms of my philosophical channel here. But I've had some really cool, a year or two years ago, I was giving away e, um, um, iPads. I wanted to encourage people to, to think about knowledge, to think about critical thinking, because I know the type of people who watch my videos. I know, not to say that, you know, if you don't watch my videos, you're not smart or anything like that. I'm clearly not saying that. But students leave and they become graduate students, graduate students become professors, they're at universities, they're doing all types of international studies, they're already um, all over the world getting scholarships for unique research that they've done and I've communicated with these people and the idea is I want to create a, a safe space for nerds, if you will. <laughs> I really do. One of the best, um, one of the best vibes I, I had on any of my YouTube channels, um, in any video I did, I gave um, an iPad to Astro Boy and I think he was a graduate student in Oslo doing some research on like semantic theory and all this other stuff. Never met the guy before in my life. He puts up a video, I might have to go back and find this video, and he talks about sort of how philosophy impacted his life. And that simple gesture 
of, no, philosophy is important. Thinking critically is important. I'm not telling you go off and get a philosophy degree. You got to eat. <laughs> Let's be practical here, right? You got to eat. You got to pay bills. We live in a real world and philosophy is not really, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't encourage my children to be philosophers. But I would encourage my children and I would encourage other, other people who are interested in, in, in knowledge and critical thinking to start thinking critically. In a sense, I really have created a community here. Right? I, I don't, I don't, I'm in no sense a guru, I don't participate with people who watch the videos a lot, I just put out as much as I can put out and people come when and if they want to come. But the idea is we now, more than ever, have the opportunity to do both. It's not just that I'm an individual and then I'm searching for groups, or I'm the head of some group and all we want are individuals, it's I am an individual and I could create a community out of my own effort and be part of that same community that I created out of my own effort. Think about all the different emerging social dynamics that could arise as a consequence of 21st century technology, as a consequence of Skype and group Skyping, of go to meetings and all of these, you know, sort of virtual digital online meeting platforms. Imagine all the possibilities that could emerge. The idea is it requires qualitative methodological analysis so that we can inform our engineers and we can inform our programmers and our coders. Wow, I didn't realize that they, there's a need for this, right? People want to do this new feature. Um, they don't want just one-on-one -on -one video feed. They want group feed. They want, you know, one-on-19 feed. They want interactive feed. They want, we need to, we need as a qualitative methodologists to push the bounds of intersubjective interaction, interpersonal interaction and write coherently and thoughtfully about these relationships. Why? You better believe people in the business community read our stuff. You better believe engineers and, uh, uh, and um, developers read our stuff. And they use our ideas in order to create new technologies, in order to facilitate emerging, this emerging paradigm, these new ways of interacting with others, right? But none of this really becomes what it could be without us talking about what uh, what that potential might be, right? So it's, I, I, I'm a fan of qualitative methodologies. I don't ever believe that it's sort of a waste of time or fleeting. Um, I think what we need to do as qualitative researchers is to continually push the bounds, the boundary of intersubjective, interpersonal interactions to, to look and be motivated, look for those narratives that are unique and generalize them so that we can, we can explain and express those things that without our effort, would never get the spotlight, right? And that's, that's what I think qualitative methodologists do best. So um, two on the top of page 21, it's important that we researchers identify how values are operationalized to represent expectations, social, religious, familial, where an individual subjects are said to either have satisfied or fail to have satisfied such expectations, more narrative than phenomenological. Don't want to spend too much time of it because it's pretty, it's pretty um, obvious. In terms of this relationship, there's an expectation, mutually shared expectation. In terms of my affiliation with a group, the group's going to have expectation of my contributions. In terms of my affiliation with the group, I'm going to have expectations about what the group is going to provide for me. The idea in terms of contemporary qualitative analysis is to reconceptualize this relationship for all of our history, from the 1960s um, even to the 1990s in terms of any number of riots, unfortunately it was categorized negatively, um, into the 21st century it has been, whether for good or bad, me in physical proximity with others. Me in physical proximity with others sitting in um, and protesting. Me in physical proximity with others walking and, and marching for our rights. Me in physical proximity with others looting or destroying something because of rage. Um, me in physical proximity with others doing stuff in the world. Um, what will that look like in the 21st century? How will that fact of our relationship, for good or bad, for good or bad, how will it unfold 
in the 21st century because there's still many communities who are marginalized. There are still many communities that are so marginalized, they're subaltern. We don't even have, the communities don't even have voice. We don't talk about these communities or these people or their plights on any national forum. How is it that we can use our emerging technologies to bring about social change? One, and I know that Arab Spring is extremely controversial, so I'll sort of, I'm treading a fine line here. But the truth of the matter is, Arab Spring, for good or bad, however you want to interpret it, the truth of Arab Spring was that the transformation was rooted in social media. And look what was, I mean, look what the consequences were. So you can't tell me that there isn't a power in virtual community. There's an enormous power in virtual community. And I don't even think we've scratched the surface. I don't even, I, we're not even close to scratching the surface yet. This technology is a decade, a decade old, if that. And if you look at Arab Spring, if you look at Arab Spring as being something that was terrible, or if you look at Arab Spring as being a representation of possibility and what was good, irrespective of how you interpret Arab Spring, the fact is, as a fact, I think both sides will agree that there was power, that there was power in this emerging technology. And the idea is, think of all the qualitative discourses that, could, that can arise out of this discussion. Um, the, the need to have internet access as a vehicle for social transformation, the need to regulate internet access as a means of making sure that these, these associations that are made online aren't going to destroy the fabric of society itself and the complexities of balancing privacy and social activity. A lot of this is still in its fledgling, a lot of the, sort of these conceptions are still in their fledgling state and we have to assume, assume the responsibility because the only person who's going to articulate it are social scientists. Right? Social scientists need to make these articulations and if we're not talking about this and we're still talking about old paradigms in the Cold War and we're talking about, you know, things that, that, that are for all relative, all practical purposes, um, defunct or soon to be defunct theoretical paradigms we're, and we're staying away from 21st century virtual discourses, then, then, then we're doomed, then we're doomed, then we're doomed. This is the narrative and it's viable. It's no longer sci-fi. It's not like, trust me, I'm telling you as a, uh, as a researcher, I know when I send my stuff off to, so graduate students, don't be discouraged, don't be discouraged. When I send my stuff off to editors, I can imagine what it looks like to read my stuff. This guy's talking about cyber technology and, and synthetic eyeballs and um, the, the possibility of sort of being with another person where that other person is, is substantially synthetic and artificial and virtual communities is, as a new social platform. And what is he talking about? Well, I mean, you know, I'm using these technologies myself. I see these uh, technologies inform how my children behave and how they act. And it's not that it's bad, it's different from how, it's changed. Society's changing and our social theorists need to start talking about this new emergence. We need more people writing on it because it's no longer science fiction. It's not science fiction, it's science fact. So we need to talk about the fact <laughs> um, and think about how these facts are gonna transform our social relationships. It's, uh, it's hugely important. So I'm gonna pause here uh, before I go to bullet point four and then come back with um, a discussion of four and five, and that will conclude our section in 1.7. To continue with uh, number four, number four is the ongoing articulation of interpretational, sorry, interpretational transformation. The ongoing articulation of interpretational transformation. Uh, number four. Funny, uh, something I'm sort of in the midst of right now. Um, interpretational transformation is pretty, pretty huge, right? It's pretty huge. Your associations with others, your association with text, for me, my whole life has really, honestly, and I mean this to the depths of my being, a lot of my life is informed by what I read. I don't really, I, I've never had many friends. Um, I, I joined a fraternity, but it was, eh, you know, whatever. Shout out to my frat brothers, blue fire all day. I love, I love my fraternity. I love the idea, and maybe I'll, I'll make contributions in the next year to the fraternity in a meaningful way, but I didn't really get a lot 
from it. Some of my front brothers went ridiculous with fraternity and they're loyal to this day and they, you know. I, I, I appreciated the sense of community but I never really got anything from it. Um, you guys who have been watching me for a while have seen my video, I think it's 147, 149, something like that, of my Nietzsche video series where I eat, <laughs> I eat my book. Um, um, reading, reading has been the greatest mentor I've ever had and I read heavily. I read heavily. I note what I read, and I, and it, it I, I don't know if it's normal. <laughs> I'm sharing too much here, but um, I don't know if it's normal. But the stuff that I read just it, it just it completely, it it hits me hard. Probably because I don't have friends and I don't have communities of others that I don't, that I associate with. I mean, aside from family and stuff. So a lot of my identity, almost all of my identity, is formed through texts. It's like I read something and it's like that's my that those are my friends. That's the community that I go to. It sounds pathetic, but don't you know, I don't need pity. Um, because I don't think it's a bad thing. And a lot of what I've read in the past has has informed who I've become to this point. And I'm indebted to the things that I've read in the past because I, I I know I'm a good person and I know what I do is good. I know it. And I'm also not idealistic and sort of pie in the sky either. You know, I I, I would hate to have become that type either. But in, ter in, in terms of this interpretational transformation, for me, this is going to be an important bit. So I just want to contextualize it, um, to contextualize sort of the power of interpretational knowledge, right? The fact that I am whatever I say I am. But part of me saying, affirming who I am, since we recognize that the I is always already connected to others, right? Part of me affirming I am whatever I say I am. Since we recognize that that I is associated with others, then I am part of my relationship with others. When I make an affirmation, I'm speaking on behalf of others. Right? When I talk, it's when you talk, when your participant talks, your participant is talking to you but is affirming others in his or her individual speech. This is why we generalize. We generalize their findings because their findings... And what they've told us in the text immediately applies to others without them even knowing who this community is. This is not hocus pocus. This is not mystical. This isn't transcendental. It's a fact of our lived experiences insofar as I talk. When I say this is da 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 da, part of the stuff that I believe in, part of the stuff that I read, part of the theorists that I read, they are speaking through me as well. All right? So you get a little bit of. Dr. Campbell, but you're getting a little bit of Kant. Despite the fact that Kant didn't like black folks, <laughs> per se, you're still getting a little bit of Kant because I'm not going to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Right? You're going to get a little bit of Nietzsche. You're going right? to get most of the German sort of idealists. You're going to get the, sort of the German system. Why? Because they inform the way in which I think. The idea is to recognize that this interpretational transformation, and I'm going to talk about it now, so I'm going to jump ahead, is part of, is wholly part, is, is wholly conditioned by, rather, because it's not a part, is wholly conditioned by this um, lived experience with others, with self, with books, with thoughts, with narrative and such. So I know it sounds sort of fluffy now. I'll give you a little bit more meat in a second. So this is 4A. Uh, this is 4A. The event. Beyond our biology, we are the composite of our lived experience. We are the composite of our lived experience. So you can imagine we have sort of experiences. Uh, C-O-M-P-O-S-I-I-T. We're the composite of our lived experience. You can imagine that all of our lived experiences are funneled into who we are as an individual. We, uh, and this, this, this is an important point, right? We, in terms of the way in which we identify ourselves, are composite of our lived experiences. But you have to recognize that our experiences are sometimes contradictory. This is the genius of Pac, right? This is the genius of Tupac. You'll have Tupac in one video, in one song, talking about who shot you, right? So you'll, you'll listen to Pac, Pac's who shot you. And obviously he's, he's paranoid, um, and he's justifiably paranoid. People try to kill him twice. He thinks this is Biggie and da da da. This is the East Coast, West Coast stuff, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, I grew up in the middle of all of this, and you watched it unfold in the world. It was the most bizarre time, because you heard it 
when when Pac rhymed. You heard it when Biggie rhymed. Shout out to 50 Cent. 50 Cent has an amazing, he had an amazing um, statement that he said. He was being interviewed by somebody sometime. I saw this years ago. And they asked him about the East Coast, West Coast beef between Pac and, and Big. And 50 Cent said something like, no, I don't, I don't rap about my own death. Why? Not because it's sort of supernatural hocus pocus belief, no. It was, if you rap about your own death continually, 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 it could bring about the, the actuality. And if you go back and listen to Big and Pac, that's all they talked about. Big and Pac, that's all they talked about all day long, all their rhymes. So Pac is rhyming about who shot you on the one hand and, you know, violence and, and you know, gang life and thug life. He has thug life tattooed on his stomach. He's got an AK-47 tattooed on his chest. There's a bullet. I mean, it's, I mean, that's Tupac. And in the other hand, he's talking about Brenda's got a baby. And he, and he, he's, he makes... He makes probably, to this date still, one of the most, what I believe, this is subjective obviously, what I believe to be one of the most authentic, subjective appeals on behalf of the plight of single women in hip-hop that's ever been done. And, and, and I can't think of any song in hip-hop that stands, I mean, he's championing um, the rights of women and their struggle for identity, for um, social recognition, for any number of problems, social problems that afflict them, and he's speaking on behalf of them as a thug man. And you say, oh, the two identities are, how could one person be the same? That's the beauty of, that's the beauty of this composite experience, right? I mean, it's great. Shout out to you if you were privileged enough to have a life where, you know, mom and dad loved each other and everything was perfect and you lived a perfect childhood and you grew up to be a well-functioning citizen and your children are good and you live that life. I mean, I'm sure... There might be a handful of communities of people that lived like that out there. I mean, you have, you have a tremendous blessing. Not in a religious sense. Also not to exclude a religious interpretation of that, but you, that's good. There are many people who have stories of abuse, of victimization, of shame, of disappointment, of failure. And they struggle with any number of things. And part of their identity is, is inherently conflict. It's conflicted. Like Tupac, the genius of him as an artist was that you felt his authentic appeal that he is both caring for Brenda and willing to kill this other guy in revenge. He was both those things. That it is okay that your interpretation of him might be complicated by this conflicted character. Now, in a much lesser degree, not that conflicted, but in a much lesser degree, sort of my presence as a ghetto philosopher is itself conflicted, right? Wow, this guy's got a lot of intellect, but this guy's clearly tattooed. He's, he's clearly sort of, you know, off the beaten path. He, there's obviously something going on in his past and his childhood and whatever. Um, but when he talks, he talks, he talks like a scholar. But when I look at him, he doesn't look the part at all. I can be both people. Why? Because when we talk about our identities, our identities are always... Our identities are always a consequence of an intersection. We're not a linear. Even though our, li our lives go, you know, from, you know, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, blah, blah, blah. And it seems that our life progresses on a linear fashion, of course it does, in terms of numerically. Part of our identity is a perpetual, and we did this in the first section with respect to Derrida, right? It's perpetual reflection back to the events of our life. So that when we get older, I can look back to the events of, you might look back to the events of your childhood and be like, you know, those things were horrible, or what happened here was bad or good, and I can transform the way in which I identify myself by transforming how I see those facts through your interpretation of those facts. Remember what we did in the first video, right? We talked about how, in the video, uh, the image, I can actually point it out so I don't have to draw it. It's on the, uh, oh, where is it? It's page, nope, that's not the page, sorry. I don't remember. It's on page six, the bottom of page six. That, that image on the bottom of page six is what we're revisiting now, but with more depth, right? The idea, if you look just, quickly turn uh, to page six, bottom of page six, you see that this is the same individual at time A in his life or her life, 
at time B, at time C, at time D. The facts of his or her past remain the same, but my identity has changed. My identity has changed because of what I'm reading. My identity has changed because of the beliefs that I've relinquished or that I've, I'm coming to accept. And the ways in which what I'm reading, the friends that I have, the communities that I'm involved with inform my interpretation is important, right? So the question that you might want to ask your participant is, how has your interpretation of your past changed? And they'll explain to you, my interpretation of my chat. What were the conditions that led to that interpretational transformation? Two separate questions, right? How has your interpretation of your past changed over the years? As I've gotten older, blah, 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 blah. What were the conditions, specifically, what were the conditions that led to that interpretational transformation? You can imagine that someone said, you know, I found a religious community. I lost my religious community. I got a good job finally. I got some job security. I started to make progress. And, you know, the fact that I, I, I had a job and I had social status now, it was perfect because I had been unemployed for so many years and that crushed who I was. The facts of my unemployment have been transformed now because I got an opportunity to work, I got a job, and when I go home I feel proud. When I, you know, I, I can imagine, uh, this is the stuff that I love. I love, you know, for, in terms of, and for those of you who are fiction writers, um, use this, use this, uh, this, um, this trope in your writing, the keys, uh, when you open the door. Mom or dad works a long day, they get home at 6 o'clock, and the door is open and you hear the keys and you're about to drop the keys down and the kids are attracted to the sound of the keys. It's a great feeling, right, to know that I went out and I worked, I fought the good fight, I can relax, and they know, my family knows that I'm here to provide for them, right? You can imagine looking back, and the reason why I use unemployment as a key, um, as a key factual reference is because it, it, it has tarnished so many people's identity, especially in the United States. Millions of people, unfortunately, millions of our, our citizens, fellow citizens in the States and anywhere in the world, not having employment, it's a fact of their past where they are in a vicious loop looking back at that fact and they're depressed and they're sad and they're, they become depressed, they become saddened because they don't feel like I'm, I'm not worth it. I don't have anything. Imagine, imagine how those facts can be transformed if you look back and said, you know, it was because of that fact that I didn't have a job, that I didn't, that I couldn't provide for my family, that forced me into the work world until I got the job. And hey, I'm, I'm here to tell you today, I've got X job, X work. You know, it might not be everything that I want it to be, but I'm transforming that past. I'm transforming the way in which I see myself and I see my past. And you know, there is, you know, I. <laughs> Wow, you got me real time. Um, yeah, I can sort of see how hope, <laughs> I can sort of see how hope would factor into it. I'm going to stop there with the hope spiel. But um, there, there is, you know, and you, those of you who watch me know I, I don't do partisan stuff in my lectures. I refuse to do it. I argue both sides. So I don't mean hope with respect to any partisanship. But there is a sense in which there is a bizarre power in which you can, you can be motivated both religiously or secularly, by hope for a better interpretational ability, right? You, you want to see the events in the past in a better way. And to, to understand how people do this, it would be great, would be great philosophical, not philosophical, but philosophical as well, but qualitative research. Like, how did you, how did you continue? How did you finally get to that end state where you were happy and that you had made the gains that you wanted to make? Um, what, tell me your story. Tell me your story and how you did this, and collect all of those stories. It would be it would be beautiful. It would be beautiful. It doesn't always have to manifest in a very doctrinal sort of dissertation. You might want to take the. I think this would be good sort of coffee table. I can see a coffee table. But I'm giving a lot here, but I, that's what I do. I can see a really good thick coffee table publication on the narratives of people unemployed in the U.S. now since maybe '07 until now compiling a lot of different stories, really good photos, um, maybe two pages, and people who haven't quite made it out of that economic recession. I know te technically we're out of the recession, but people who haven't quite made it out yet and have hope that they will, and people who have made it out and disclose some stories. Can you imagine? You, you, you sit down at a coffee table, you flip open, you look at it, you read two short pages of someone's story, you see the picture of the family. Oh, give me a break. 
all built on qualitative study, right? All built on the way in which the individual's interpretation transformed and how a more positive outlook, a more hopeful outlook gave the individual the opportunity to persist and to become better and make better contributions. I mean, in my old age, I can tell I'm going to be all super mushy and <laughs> optimistic and all blah, blah, blah. But, you know, um, why not? Why not? Why not have a little bit of hope? Um, so that's part of four. So the idea is um, we embody the event, right? We, we, are, we are composites of these events and these experiences, and we can transform our understanding of self and what we're able to contribute and what our, par our participants can offer us in our contribution if we recognize that our interpretations are continually transforming. Right? I wrote reader, re I wrote reader response on the board a couple lectures back, but this is the idea that uh, the interpretation of the facts are always transforming. Right? So for one, here's the assumption, experience and events are one and the same thing. They are not. They are not. Separating the experience from the event, that is, the facts allow us to transform our interpretations of the event as we gain more life experience. That's what I just said. Thus, life experience is a mode. Life experience, your actual experience of living, is a mode of interpretational transformation. Your life day to day, the things that you experience day to day, are a mode of how we see the world. You can see the world as hostile, you can see the world as helpful, you can see the events that you're going through as an opportunity for a learning experience, as an opportunity for giving back. This is, I mean, obviously this informed who I've been, who I've always been because my interest in my own qualitative research was in talking with Holocaust survivors because the idea of having survived something that heinous that's systematically unjust and you meet these people and I've met many of them and they've gone on to do amazing things they've gone on to make amazing contributions is a testament I think to the resilience of the human experience and getting narratives of that resilience is important right it's very very important why because all of us have low times all of us have moments of insecurity all of us have moments of fear, of anxiety. We all go through this. I don't care who you are on this planet. Everybody goes through it. And it's at those moments when you're most vulnerable because you feel like this is the only interpretation. <laughs> and what's going to be good for this in terms of a qualitative research is that you've experienced this. I've experienced this. So you can sense this in your participants and their disclosure. If they tell you this type of narrative, it's, I really believe there was no other way to interpret this. Everybody was out to get me and I don't know why because I felt like I was doing good stuff. Or everybody thinks I'm bad or I was bad. I was so regretful. I was so hateful. I was so angry. But then it changed. Then I stopped being angry. Then I stopped being vengeful. Then I stopped being, you know, anxious. And the conditions that led to that interpretational transformation helped bring the person out of that state. Right? help transform their lives. But the idea is to talk about these narratives, to exchange stories, truthfully, of how people transform. So just a, as a quick side, so that I'm fair here in this, it wouldn't be fair to, I live this, I really live this. So I'll just disclose a little bit of my own personal narrative, two minutes tops, I'm not going to sort of belabor the point. Of course there are times at which I get sort of saddened by my own life experience for any number of reasons. And one of, the, one of the things that I do in order to build myself out of that state is this. I get a lot of satisfaction out of making these contributions. It's not about the views. It's not about the comments. It's not about, it's not about the fame or any of that as much as it is. I know that this is good. I know what I'm doing is a good contribution for others. And just the fact that I'm making this contribution hour after hour after hour after hour after year after year after year, it, it, it brings meaning to my life. It brings purpose to my existence. I feel like, hey, you know, this is not going to change the world. We're not all going to be roasting marshmallows. But at least the next generation of leaders, the next generation of politicians and deans and academics, 
people who use this to think critically, to analyze stuff, to use logic in order to formulate good plans and make good decisions and transform the world, at least I help them a bit. So, if I'm sad, focus on work. That helps me out. You can imagine other people might not have work to focus, um, but they found a way out that wasn't work. Well, what was that narrative? Tell me your narrative. So that I understand, because I don't have what Dr. Campbell has. Dr. Campbell, I'm great that worked for you, but that's not going to do it for me. Okay, no problem. There are tons of people that my disclosure would help them. The idea is to get and to compile a composite of all of these experiences, and the only way it's done is through interviews. Right? And NPR can't be the only people that are doing this. Right? We need, especially now, podcasts. We need a whole plethora of young students out there starting your own podcast, going out to interview John and Jane Doe on the street about their experience of X, Y, Z, right? And, and, and get, the, get and compile the necessary stories so that your stories transcend the lived experience of just that one person. That the story of this person can appeal to a broader community. And I'll give one example before I move on. I was to an NPR months back. Um, journalist who ends up getting a whole bunch of awards for her research and her, you know, her contributions, rightfully so. She's in the middle of a conflict in Syria. She was over there doing um, journalism on the conflict in Syria. And you hear, like, the gunshots in the background. So you, you I mean, you hear the gunshots in the background. And you hear people running and screaming, and she's talking, like, we're fleeing right now, they're shooting at the people, blah, 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 and you're just like, I can't, like, unbelievable, unbelievable. Right, so she's talking in the mic, da da da, and it, it, it's the it's probably it's it's gonna stick with me for the rest of my life. For the rest of my life, the story's gonna stick with me. She had the she had the sort of the the she had the mental acumen to recognize that she is narrating her life experience real time, and that her audience is listening to her account, and whatever she saw she was describing, and it was amazing that it's like you got an insight into her brain at that instance. Something on the floor, like maybe a, let's say, a, I don't know if it was a doll who had been discarded or something that had been discarded in the roughage and the, while people were fleeing. She had, the, she had the foresight to recognize that her audience might want to share that experience, and she, while she's running, from whoever's shooting, described yeah, and I just passed, like, some, you know, a, a, you know, a discarded doll. Da, 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 she moved on. Can you imagine? Can you imagine how the disclosure of that narrative, it's not just her story anymore. It's our story. You can imagine, you can imagine the condition in which fear was so overwhelming, the, the, the threat was so, was so powerful that the young girl, probably, running with her doll, had to abandon her, or had to abandon it for herself. And there it is discarded. And she now telling us about that discarded doll, the fact that it caught her eye. Um, we all have connection to, to, to those decisions in our lives where we have to discard those things that we hold dear. We have to discard those things that we've identified with for years, decades even. Why? So that we can preserve self. Because we recognize it really isn't helping me now. There's, it doesn't have to be as ominous as uh, sort of the impending threat on your life, but you get you get the you get a sense uh, and stuff like that. I love you get a sense that no, there is something bigger. There's something bigger at stake here, and much of my identity has been tied to these other things. But it, it might be time for me to discard these other things so that I can continue to become. I mean, that is that's the stuff that I love to read that's the stuff that I love to read right and if, if, if that if you feel that you can you can um, cultivate good qualitative methodology on that vibe then please by all means do um, and then lastly uh, uh, number five number five the role of self-affirmation in subjectivity. So in terms of subjectivity, this is a direct quote, this is because man in fact can be revealed only when bound to a previously existing history. We come to the fore, we come into this um, nexus of social interaction with our history, our personal history and our history. So my personal narrative, my personal story is important to understanding who I am as a person, 
but also the historical fact that I was born in Jamaica, left when I was young, raised in America since the time I could, you know, learn language, informs a lot of who I am, right? Um, the fact that in terms of your participant, your participant's personal narrative, the way in which his or her relationship to a community of speakers, a nation, um, a church affiliation or lack thereof, his or her relationships inform our understanding of the individual. That understanding helps inform um, those relationships, the importance that's placed on it for the individual. Some people put more emphasis on their associations and their friendships than others. The idea is we are always in the process of coming to have a better understanding of um, these, these narratives. Right? So this is the always already, I've discussed that uh, at length already. So only two more points before we move on to 1.8. So this is 5.1. Origin is the way in which man articulates himself upon the already begun of labor, life, and language. So it is the way in which you define yourself, right? You can make, sort of, your participant can make him or herself anew. I can reflect on who it is that I am, the experiences that I've had, how I got to be here now, and articulate a new origin, right? So that the origin isn't just of our past. We're not forever linked to that past, linked to our biological origin. You know, I was born on this day at this time this year. Sure, that's our sort of biological or origin, but you are always in a you are always in a position, always in a position of reaffirming your identity. You can identify and rearticulate a new origin, right? I I'm going to be the type of person who's going to complete my education because I tried three, four times in the past. I just couldn't do it. Um, but this is the time when I do it. I'm it could be something as trivial. This for me, you know, I, I always say this. I don't know if I'm going to have the time. I am going to learn another language. We live in a global world. It is unacceptable to only speak English. I have to learn another language. Okay, so, you know, New Year, the language acquisition. I got to figure that out somehow. I got to speak a second language. Is this going to happen or not? May, uh, who knows? We'll see. But you get the idea, right? There's always an opportunity to redefine self. And the ways in which people redefine self are good ways of demarcating their life history, right? Okay, so there was a time in my life where I was, I was young, I was impoverished, and it was out of that impoverishment that I was driven to success. So I start my business, and, and thus I get, you know, my business running. Then there was a time, there's a commercial, I forget what commercial it was, somebody has this commercial where it was like, then I get the business, and the business... Um, it's about getting the business successful and the business becomes successful. Then it's about, you know, um, hiring more, expanding, da, 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 then it expands. Now I've made it, the business is as successful as it can be, and now I'm giving back. You can see sort of, you can see um, the, the arc of the business life by this sort of narrative, but at each node of transformation, there's a new beginning, right? No, I'm no longer trying to get established. I'm already established. I want to get bigger. Now it's not about getting bigger. I'm as big as I want to be, as big as I, for practical purposes, can be. Now it's about giving back and so on and so forth, right? In our personal narrative, it's exactly the same, right? It's about, I wanted to have a family. I got the family. I got the family. I want to raise the kids. I raise the kids. I want to be a good grandparent and on and on. Any number of things, the ways in which our personal narratives change, those forks in the road, Every single time we select one side rather than the other is a new origin, a new story of who we are. And the identity of the individual is tied to those decisions. I decided to do this and not do that, and because I made that decision, I became this new thing. Um, it's always difficult, trust me. You know, I, you've had life experiences, I've had life experiences. Those decisions, those forks in the world are, 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 are life-transforming, right? They're, they're never easy to make, but if you make the right decisions... Um, and in making the right decisions, you're able to see the benefits. And in terms of our qualitative um, methodologies, it's identifying in our participants' narrative a recognition of those decisions. It was because I decided to go back to school. It was because I decided to learn that language. It was because that I did X, Y, Z that I now have this benefit in my life, that I now am able to do this good social contribution, right? But the idea is hindsight is always 20-20. The good thing about qualitative methodologies is that you're offering the participant the opportunity to look back on his or her life experience and identify what those factors, what those conditions were that led him or her 
to make the right decision. So, uh, very important. Lastly, then, on page uh, 21, this is 5.2, it would be a fascinating qualitative analysis to interview polymaths, for example, socially or individually recognized, um, and assess the manner of their or ongoing self reaffirmation. I am da, da, da. so you could uh, the polymath is an individual who's good at any number of things: good at math, good at science, good at reading, good at language, good at all of these other things. It's just an example, and ask them how they continually transform themselves. How is it that you're able to do this? Think about the business person who has any number of businesses that he or she has launched. Right? I went into engineering, then I went into computers, then I went into clothes production, then I went into software development, and I was successful in all of these businesses. Um, I'm sure a bit of luck happened, but what, what makes you so successful? How are you able to diversify yourself? I mean, that's great analysis, not just for business community, because of any number of things. I want, I, I'm at the top point in my life now where I really want to read those stories. Right? I want to read about people who aren't just successful in one endeavor, but people who have gone about it and found success in many different things. Why? Because it suggests that there might be a process. It might be definitive for just that person, but if there's a process, if there's a mode of existence in which, yeah, incorporating these daily factors into my life or seeing the world um, via this interpretational, uh, interpretive lens might facilitate a better mode of existing, a more peaceful mode of existing, a more conducive mode of existing for social contribution, why wouldn't you want to learn that? Right? You, it doesn't always have to be sort of this motivational bit. Motivational speakers, of course, they corner the market on this, but I'm a little, I'm a little sort of cautious about it. Not to disparage it at all, but I'm a little cautious of sort of the motivational speaking bit, um, which is not to discredit in any sense. I, I would like to see good qualitative methodology and met, um, good qualitative methodological analysis that could that could describe um, a, a potential. This might be a good grounded theory a potential grounded theory that we could test, that we could assess, that we might be able to generalize for individuals to find the things that they, that they can't attain of themselves. We need so much from others in order to become who we want to be. We need educators to give. We need therapists to listen. We need political leaders to be motivated to act on our behalf. We need religious communities to have faith where there's no reason to have anything else because reality sucks. We need, we need police officers and, um, to defend. We need so much. We need so much from other people. And the idea is it's okay. It's part of what it is to be um, a human being, but make sure that we give back and we have an understanding of this sort of interplay. The beautiful thing about qualitative methodologies and qualitative analysis is that it's qualitative. It's that it's okay to sit down and listen to a story. It's okay to sit down and have someone disclose their life experience to you and laugh or cry. Qualitative analysis is about, in the end, human experience. It's about sharing stories of ourselves. That's what all of this boils down to. So if it's fluffy or if it's too verbose, then it's a consequence of who that person is, and it's okay. And the best qualitative, and I think this is key, right, the best qualitative analysis are those analyses that reach into and touch and speak to the heart of the experience of the participant. And the question is, you need to, as the researcher, find a proper methodological approach to create a sense of comfort, to be mindful enough, to be courteous enough, to be thoughtful enough, such that the participant wants to disclose his or her life experiences. Because the truth of the matter is, people are usually, they usually have their guards up when it comes to disclosing their personal narratives, and to create an environment where there's a sense of comfort, where there's a sense of ease, a sense of understanding, so they can disclose and trust you, the researcher, enough to disclose their life stories is what this is all about. This is what this is all about. So if anything that I've said what you should be thinking about through all of these hours and hours of video is I like that approach. That's a good approach because I think that approach, as implemented through me, might facilitate disclosure, might facilitate comfort, might facilitate ease so that I can take 
what they've given me and generalize it to a broader community. If anything, and I've said many things, but if anything I've said in the hours of lecture allow you to do that, then I've done my job. Uh, I've done my job well. So that concludes section 1.7. I want to thank you for taking the time to watch my videos. I'm Dr. Jason J. Campbell. Have a good day.